Welcome to today's ERA Journal Club. My name is Kate Stevens, and with my colleague Jennifer Lees, we will be moderating this session. We are both nephrologists from Glasgow in the UK, and we are honoured to welcome our speaker and panellists. So Prof Rajiv Agarwal, who is a professor of medicine in Indianapolis in the United States, is going to present on his recently published paper in MDT which looked at the effects of canagliflozin versus finerenone on cardiorenal outcomes. And it was exploratory post hoc analyses from Fidelio DKD compared with reported credence results. So extremely topical. We'll move to our panel discussion and we are privileged to have our colleague, Professor Paddy Mark, um, originally from Ireland, but now calls Glasgow his home, also a professor of nephrology. And Professor Cathy Tuttle, we're particularly delighted to have Cathy with us because it's about half past seven in the morning in Washington in the United States where Cathy works as a professor of medicine and nephrology. There's a couple of housekeeping um, points to make before we start. Um, at the end of today, um, there will be a survey that appears and it'd be great if you could fill that in so we can try and make sure that you get the best experience possible going forward with these sessions. And if you have any questions or comments, please make them in the Q&A function, which you can see on your screen. And Jen and I will do our best to put them to the speaker and our panelists. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Prof Agarwal. Hello, I'm Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, Professor of Medicine at Indiana University School of Medicine and Staff Physician at the VA Medical Center in Indianapolis, Indiana, USA. I'm delighted to present you the results of a study published in Nephrology Dialysis Transplantation, and I'm honored that ERA EDTA has selected this work as the inaugural journal club article. The name of the publication is Effects of Canagliflozin versus Phenernone on Cardiorenal Outcomes, Exploratory Post Hoc Analysis from Fidelio DKD Compared to Reported Credence Results. The study was funded by Bayer, and here are my disclosures. Phenernone is a novel selective non-steroidal MRA that inhibits MR overactivation. In the Fidelio DKD population that had albuminuria, advanced CKD, and type 2 diabetes, as well as well-controlled blood pressure, hemoglobin A1c, and were treated with optimized RAS inhibitor therapy, it was demonstrated that phenernone reduced CKD progression by 18% and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality by 14%. The primary endpoint of this trial was CKD progression, whereas the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality was a key secondary endpoint. Both of these endpoints were pre-specified and the study was powered to evaluate each of these outcomes independently. The primary endpoint in the Fidelio DKD trial was kidney specific. The endpoint consisted of a composite of 40% decrease in EGFR, sustained reduction in EGFR 15 mLs per minute or less, end-stage kidney disease defined by long-term dialysis or kidney transplantation, or death from kidney failure. The hazard of the composite kidney outcome was reduced by 18%. We can calculate from the absolute risk reduction that over three years, 29 patients treated with phenernone would save one such kidney outcome. Two SGLT2 inhibitors, kidney outcome trials, Credence and DAPA-CKD, have also reported positive cardiorenal outcomes for patients with CKD and type 2 diabetes, and also among patients with CKD without two type 2 diabetes in DAPA-CKD trial. In the Credence trial, the primary endpoint of which is shown here the relative risk of primary outcome was reduced by 30%. In the DAPA-CKD trial, the cardiorenal composite was reduced by 39%. At first glance, phenernone may be perceived to have a smaller benefit on kidney outcome compared with SGLT2 inhibitors, canagliflozin and dapagliflozin. 
For example, in the Fidelio DKD trial, the risk reduction is 18% versus in the Credence trial, the risk reduction is 30%. The question is whether phenernone is inferior to canagliflozin in preventing cardiorenal outcomes in patients with albuminuria and type 2 diabetes. The objective of this analysis was to facilitate a more nuanced comparison of the treatment effect of phenernone with that of canagliflozin by adjusting for key differences in the trial design. These include three major differences, restricting the analysis to a subgroup of patients from Fidelio DKD who met the CKD inclusion criteria of Credence, using cardiorenal composite endpoints equivalent to that used in the Credence trial and adjusting for differences in baseline heart failure incidence. We included the adjustment for heart failure incidence because prior studies have shown that heart failure in patients with CKD can affect cardiovascular outcomes and that these patients benefit for, from treatment with SGLT2 inhibitors or MRAs. We restricted our comparisons to Credence because similar comparisons cannot be made between Fidelio DKD and DAPA CKD because DAPA CKD included patients without diabetes, a group not included in the Fidelio DKD trial, and the primary endpoint in DAPA CKD was a 50% reduction in EGFR, which was not an adjudicated event in Fidelio DKD. I will now explain in greater detail some important differences between the study designs of the Fidelio DKD and Credence trial. First, the inclusion exclusion criteria. In the Fidelio DKD trial, the entry criteria was EGFR between 25 to less than 75, versus in the Credence trial, it was between 30 and 90. Second, the urine albumin to creatinine ratio were between 30 and 5,000 milligram per gram creatinine in Fidelio DKD trial compared with 300 to 5,000 milligram per gram creatinine in the Credence trial. Third, Fidelio DKD excluded patients with symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, whereas Credence excluded patients with heart failure only if they were treated with an MRA. In Credence, for example, MRA was use was an exclusion criteria although post-baseline use was permitted if deemed medically necessary. In the Fidelio DKD trial, potassium of more than 4.8 was an exclusion criteria, whereas in the Credence trial, patients with potassium more than 5.5 were excluded. There were also some key differences between the endpoint definition among the trials. The kidney-specific composite endpoint for Fidelio DKD was similar to Credence, except that in Fidelio, a sustained 40% decrease in EGFR was needed to qualify for this endpoint, unlike in Credence, where a sustained doubling of serum creatinine was required. This translates to a decrease of at least 50% in GFR from baseline. Furthermore, Credence had cardiovascular death as a component of its composite endpoint whereas Fidelio DKD did not. A total of 4,619 out of 5,674 patients, approximately 81% in the Fidelio DKD trial, met the credence-like criteria of having an USCR between 300 to 5,000 and EGFR between 30 and 75 at screening and therefore were included in this analysis. The comparison of baseline demographics from the Fidelio DKD subgroup and Credence group found that they were broadly similar with regard to duration of diabetes, RAS inhibitor use, and the percentage of patients who were African American and Caucasian. However, there were some notable differences in the Fidelio DKD Credence like subgroup. They were slightly older, had a lower systolic blood pressure and lower glycated hemoglobin. There were also fewer patients with a history of heart failure, and there were more frequent use of cardiovascular medications and a greater proportion of Asian patients. 
GLP-1 RAs were more frequently used in the Fidelio DKD study, approximately 7% versus 4% in the Credence trial. SGLT2 inhibitors were used in about 5% of the patients compared to half the randomized population in Credence. The treatment with phenernone and placebo was balanced approximately 50-50, and the baseline characteristics between placebo and phenernone treatment were similar. The medium follow-up was 2.6 years. A total of 27.6% of the patients prematurely discontinued treatment in the study, and the number of discontinuations was similar between treatment arms. Of the 4,608 patients assessed, mean treatment adherence was high at 92%. Median UACR was similar between groups. However, EGFR was much lower in the Fidelio DKD trial at a mean of 46.5 compared to 56.2 in the Credence trial. This is because there were few patients with GFR more than 60 in the Fidelio DKD trial compared to the Credence trial. This is an important consideration because early SGLT2 inhibitor trials have demonstrated a diminishing effect on kidney protection with lower EGFR. Examining the kidney specific endpoint in Fidelio DKD, the relative risk reduction was 18% versus credence at 30%. However, when we matched the equivalent endpoints or the cardiorenal endpoint that credence used in the Fidelio analysis, a 22% relative risk reduction was seen. When we match equivalent CKD entry criteria, which is patients with a GFR between 25 and 75 and albuminuria more than 300 to 5,000, we have a relative risk reduction of 26%. However, note we cannot adjust for high GFR in the credence population because there were many patients in credence with an EGFR between 75 and 90 which obviously were excluded in the Fidelio DKD analysis by inclusion-exclusion criteria. When we match the incidence of heart failure in the two trials, we find that the relative risk reduction is 28%, which is quite close to 30% relative risk reduction seen in the Credence trial. The incidences of each of the components of the cardiorenal composite was lower with phenernone than placebo. Notably, the risk of ESKD was 28% lower with phenernone versus placebo. Overall, the relative risk of cardiorenal composite endpoint in the placebo groups of either trial, Fidelio DKD or Credence, was similar with event rates of 59.5 and 61.2 per 1,000 patient years, as were the incidences of EGFR less than 15 and ESKD. However, the incidence rate of sustained decline of more than 57% from baseline was larger in the placebo arm of the Fidelio DKD group than the credence population at 33.8 patients with events per 1,000 patient years. The CV death rate was lower with placebo in Fidelio DKD than in credence 18.6 versus 24.4 patients with events per 1,000 patient years. The time course of improvement in cardiorenal outcomes in Fidelio DKD compared to the credence shows similar trajectories of improvement. In the Fidelio DKD credence-like subgroup, Phenernone reduced the risk of cardiorenal composite outcomes by 26% versus placebo. After adjusting for differences in baseline history of heart failure in the two trials, the adjusted hazard ratio showed an improvement of 28% relative to placebo in the Fidelio DKD trial. In summary, this analysis highlights the pitfalls of direct comparisons between trials. Subtle differences in the inclusion-exclusion criteria, especially heart failure, and outcome definitions lead to meaningful differences in outcomes. Notably, we cannot adjust for the higher 
EGFR that was studied in the Creedence study because we excluded patients with EGFR between 75 and 90 in the Fidelio DKD analysis. When key differences in trial design are accounted for, both Fidelio DKD and Credence demonstrate a cardiorenal benefit of a similar magnitude. In the Fidelio DKD, the relative risk reduction was 28%, and in the Credence trial, it was 30%. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Agarwal. That was a really enjoyable comparison. Uh, and I always think that the kidney treatments are a bit like buses, as we've discussed, none come along and then two seem to appear at once. Um, so first of all, just a reminder to the um, audience watching at home that you can post your questions in the Q&A uh, and we'll keep an eye out for those and ask uh, those questions of our speaker and panellists. Um, but if it's OK, what I'd like to do is start the discussion um, just with a question about adverse events. Um, so I wonder first, Professor Agarwal, if you could talk us through uh, any differences um, in adverse events uh, that were apparent between the two uh, studies and in particular in this subgroup analysis. Very similar uh, adverse events. So we have reported these adverse events in the main paper. No surprises here. Uh, the major adverse event was uh, hyperkalemia uh, that happens with penarinone and number of people who uh, discontinue the treatment permanently uh, in the Fidelio overall study was 2.3% versus 0.9% in placebo. And there were very comparable numbers even here. Um, the other uh, two things that are there in the label and should be mindful for of is uh, hypotension or dizziness, you know, and the other one is hyponatremia. Those are in the US label for the drug. Uh, they are infrequent. Uh, they are not thing to get too concerned about, but that's something to monitor. And it's easy to do that because, you know, anytime patient comes to us, we measure the creatinine, potassium, sodium as a panel. So it shouldn't be a problem. And I wonder if you could, uh, just as a follow-up question, tell me about severity of hyperkalemia. So incidence, incidence is one thing, obviously, but you know, actual level of hyperkalemia is another. How, how high did the potassiums tend to get? So the mean difference between the two groups at, uh, is about 0.23 millicolons per liter. If you average out all the levels of potassium uh, in the placebo group versus the uh, phenernone group, the mean difference is 0.23. Now, mean difference will not tell you how many people got terrible hyperkalemia. So we have published these analyses and they are published in JSON not too long ago from the uh, Fidelio trial. Uh, the, uh, what we report are three different numbers. One is uh, the uh, adverse events of hyperkalemia as reported by the investigators. Uh, that happens because uh, the patient goes to the hospital, they have a local lab drawn, and you can report hyperkalemia. And that's probably the most relevant endpoint. The second thing you can report is the potassium, which is more than 5.5, that is measured at the central lab. The beauty of that is that there won't be any variation across sites because it's going to a central lab, uh, but it might underreport because you're not capturing those which might happen in the hospital and hyperkalemia might occur without a central lab. So that might be missed. And the third uh, is where your potassium is more than six, right? So the more than six is very few, less than 1% of the patients have more than six. The, the, perhaps the most important one is how many patients in the Fidelio trial had hyperkalemia sufficient to need dialysis. That's perhaps the most severe. There was one patient and that patient happened to be on placebo. So there are very few, but you know, I think that when we do more real world studies, we'll probably find more hyperkalemia uh, because you know, these patients are not just followed for a median of 2.6 years, for example, in Fidelio, they are followed for eight, 10 years and when you do that, you certainly have to monitor the potassium closely. It probably is much less hyperkalemia than spinal lactone, 
but it doesn't mean that we should ignore it, that the hyperkalemia has vanished. That's probably the only one that we need to monitor and be cognizant of and treat. Okay, so so can I uh, can I come in? And we'll give you a break, Prof Agarwal. You you worked hard for your with your money or or your not money today. Um, so I'm going to come to Paddy next, if you don't mind. So just to bring in the panel, we've had a question from the audience from Peter Winokur asking: Was there even a signal that the five percent in Fidelio, also on SGLT2 inhibitors, had any cardiorenal or potassium advantage compared to the group not in these agents, or were numbers too small to make any comment? So, Paddy, what do, what do you think? Could you pass comment? Uh, so I've got the classic thing of these Zoom calls. My daughter has just arrived from school and shouted, Dad, inevitably, just as you turned to me for a question. So obviously, so I, I had to give some context that Peter Winokur is an old colleague of mine, one of the UK's leading sort of uh, diabetologists in the world of cardiovascular medicine. So um, I always take his questions very seriously. And I think it's this sort of highlights what we all really want to know about the both these agents the, the the two agents along at once to have um you know what are they going to have be like in combination because those trial i don't think there's enough data personally from either trial to comment on that I, I, um or even for their own or going back to old-fashioned spironolactone or a player unknown but really this is where people are excited to go next but we don't have the data and I don't think we can, personally, I don't think we can comment, but I'd be interested to put that back to Prof Agarwal or, or, or Kathy or anyone else to, th to think about where the field is going with combination of SGLT2 plus uh, novel MRA, because that's where I get excited about where we need to go. So will we, will we put it to Kathy then, first of all, and then we can come back to you, um, Rajiv. So Ka Kathy, what do you think? Well, well, I agree with Patty, but there is a signal there that um, and and I, I believe Peter Rossing was the first author on the paper, the, the secondary or post hoc analysis from Fidelio, showing that in the, at least the small subset, uh, which was about 5% or so, I believe, Rajiv, who received SGLT2, that investigator reported hyperkalemia was less frequent in the SGLT2 users compared to those who weren't SGLT2 users. Um, and then uh, we actually have a paper coming out in Diabetes Care, which is a pooled analysis of the empagliflozin trials, looking at um, safety by GFR. And in the pooled studies, so this includes um, the cardiovascular trials, the heart failure trials, and the Empereg outcome trial, uh, we found that the the risk of investigator-reported hyperkalemia. Now, these are not an MR, necessarily MRA-treated patients. With EMPA was reduced by about a third. And the benefit on hyperkalemia extended even into people with CKD stage four. So all of this is observational and post hoc, but there is a signal for less hyperkalemia. And that's actually very attractive when we think about combination therapies not only for efficacy, but even for safety. So you could imagine that it might be possible to keep someone on finerenone uh, with an SGLT2 inhibitor if hyperkalemia had been a limiting side effect. But I think that's for future research, it's hypothesis generating, but it, it's actually nice when a side effect of one uh, actually um, benefits the other and would allow us to give combination therapies um, both more safely and, and hopefully more effectively. But again, I want to be clear that, that that is future study, but that's the signal that's emerging. So I have a, a follow-up question um, from that comment. So in, in terms of where the future studies will go, um, I wondered what uh, the panel thought about whether that was likely to be done within trials. So should we be doing trials of these combination therapies against single therapies against placebo um, or should we be using other types of um, research tools? So, for example, assessment of observational data to pick out um, these uh, potential side effects and, and outcomes. And the particular reason I ask that question is because we know that in many trials, people uh, with multiple uh, comorbidities or multimorbidity are excluded. And those are exactly the people that are more likely to be at risk of long-term side effects. So I wondered how, how the panel thought we could uh, answer that question next. Prof Agarwal, would you like to comment? Yeah, you know, um, 
Great question, uh, Jennifer. I, I, I want to uh, start where uh, Kathy left off. I mean, she uh, absolutely correctly pointed out that when you use SGLT2 inhibitors in combination with finerenone, you actually, or other uh, MRAs, you can actually mitigate the hyperkalemia signal. Uh, there was a, a study that was published uh, very recently in Kidney International Reports uh, looking at uh, eplernone use in DAPA CKD. And they found that when people were randomized to DAPA with, epler uh, with eplernone, they actually had less hyperkalemia compared to placebo. Now, um, uh, while that is true, uh, these are all post hoc analyses. And I was asked to write an editorial and um, I asked people to look at interaction effects, p values, and confidence intervals. So if you look at the interaction effects of any trial and you find an absence of an interaction, the first question you have to pose is, is the trial power to look at an interaction effect? Most of these trials are not. You know, if you look at even the fidelity analysis, which has got 13,026 patients, only about 7% of those patients on SGLT2 inhibitors. So they are clearly inadequate. They have inadequate power to look at it, to look at the, the benefits of the combination therapy. Because, you know, we now have been gifted with two drugs, right? SGLT2 inhibitors and, and uh, finerenone. And obviously we're asking, hey, if we put them together, can we do better? And you know, most of us think that way, but thinking just doesn't make it so, right? Because we are doing all these post hoc analyses. So the confidence in these findings is low. And today we announced the confidence trial. It's called the confidence trial. It has nothing to do with confidence interval. It's all called the confidence trial. And this trial actually directly is a randomized control trial of more than 800 patients that has three arms to it. Uh, it has either empagliflozin alone or finerenone alone or the combination of the two in people with type 2 diabetes and, uh, and chronic kidney disease. Um, and we're asking the question, if you use the combination of finerenone with empagliflozin, do you have an improvement in albuminuria, reduction in albuminuria that is above and beyond just empagliflozin alone? Because you know, the way you can answer these studies is only through randomized trials. You can try to do post hoc analyses, observational studies, but this is a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial, right? And it was just announced uh, today. And I think that this will probably carry the field forward. So you might ask, okay, so why didn't you do a real outcome trial? You know, look at cardiovascular and kidney outcomes. <laughs> Well, the answer is very simple. You need 40,000 patients to do that kind of a trial. Can't do it. So, you know, what can we do? Well, we can actually do an albuminuria trial. And 800 patients is not that small. We should be able to look at the potassium signals, hypotension, and other complications because they are substantial duration of effects. So that's something that is brand new, right heart of the press. Uh, Bear announced it this morning. Can I can I come in on that? Uh, so, um, so so um, there is um, so it's not with finerenone, but there is with another um, novel MRA that AstraZeneca are doing. There's another trial in heart failure patients looking at this as albuminuria as an endpoint. I think the trial is called Miracle, um, and it again I believe it's at the point it's it's registered in clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, just looking just there and there. Just, so again, there are clearly the industry are pushing this um because those are the trials we want and but it's it's a bit of a pity isn't it to go back to that surrogate endpoint of albuminuria but it's it is, but we will get more of a feel for the combination and the, the effect on high on, and genuine randomized prospective trials on hype to see what the effect of potassium is because i think that's the only thing that's really holding us back isn't that this and it's a niggling concern you know for the I, I think you know you should be congratulated and uh in the finerenone clinical trials, how low the incidence of, hyper of hyperkalemia is, but it still was the signal that we all worry about, and we all have the experience of rails and then hyperkalemia after that. So um, I'm sure we'll let anyone uh, say our two our two moderators are so much younger than the three of us, but we all remember when with the, the post rails 
thing came out by David Gerling, the, uh, the, the great instance of hyperkalemia. So I think we that's the, that's the niggling thing. And whether, as Kathy highlights, that SGLT2 will help ameliorate this issue is, is where we really want to know and we now need prospective trial data for us to support that. I have a question about the trial that's just been announced. Will these patients be people who are already established on ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers? Yes, they're all on background of ACE arm, so they have to be on the standard of care. Yes, absolutely. And Jennifer, if I could circle back to, I think, the question that you posed earlier about sources of evidence. Um, I do think that now with the emergence of big data and real world evidence, that is a very important opportunity, particularly to assess safety along the lines of what you're we were talking about as the use expands to populations who may be sicker or more complicated than the people who were able to participate in the clinical trials. And so I, I think the other good news now is with these very large databases that we have from real world practice, and from different regions of the world, uh, we will be able to see what kinds of patients actually receive these therapies, whether they're able to stay on these therapies, and then take a closer look at the safety signals at a minimum. And then also too, especially as time and numbers accrue, it's a great way, I think, to externally validate of the trials to clinical practice. And as you know, one of the biggest problems though has been underutilization. You know, we've really fallen short on implementation. So that's also a way that we can track uh, implementation and hopefully make course corrections uh, to make sure that the patients who would qualify for these agents are actually receiving them. So um, I, th I think it's a very exciting time because not only do we have these trials, we have breakthrough therapies, they appear to be complementary, but we also have a chance to monitor what's going on in the population, which is a chance to really improve accessibility to these life-saving therapies. Um, well, sorry, Jen. No, on you go. So I was just going to, um, I actually want to ask two things. So the, the first is a question from the audience from Elia Rzegetti. So just asking, considering the risk of hyperkalemia, would there be a role for using one of the potassium binding therapies like pteromere, for example, in order to facilitate the use of, of SGLT2s and NMRAs? What are your thoughts? Rajiv, we come to you first. Well, you know, first of all, um, in the clinical trial setting, um, so we're talking about Fidelio and Figaro, uh, we allowed their use and their use was slightly higher in people who uh, were using phenernone. So there's no contraindication to the use of those drugs. The bigger question is, um, what is really producing the benefits? Is it phenernone or is it the um, ACE or ARBs as a background? Is the combination actually producing more risk for hyperkalemia or is that also adding to the benefit? I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. But you know, as clinicians, when patients get hyperkalemic, the knee jerk response is you stop everything and they are, most of these patients are never placed on any RAS inhibitor again. At least in my system, they are called allergic and they are never placed on it. The real world evidence also suggests is that when patients get hyperkalemic, they are not treated with these agents. I'm not sure if that's a right approach or wrong approach. I think very soon we will hear the announcement of the results of the Diamond trial, which was uh, looking at uh, Petermar enabling the use of spironolactone uh, for cardiovascular outcomes in a high risk population. I think that should be announced in a few months and we probably would have better clarity on this. Okay, and um, so I want to ask something else, just changing tact very slightly. So Kathy, you've alluded to accessibility to all these medications and you know, you and I have discussed this before. So how do we ensure that um, patients get access to all of these medications, which you know, you've, you've commented and you know, I, I like this quote, dialysis is no longer a destination. How, you know, how, how do we make sure, particularly in places like America where people have to pay for the medications or in some of the low and middle income countries where you know, they, they can't afford these medications. So what, what are we gonna do to, to try and make sure that people can have access to these like really genuinely life-changing treatments, most exciting um, advancement in CKD in, in a long, long time? 
Kathy, you're up. <laughs> Yeah, no, those are those are really important questions. I don't think they're answerable, but I'll give you some ideas about things that we can do. So yes, in the United States, particularly cost is a huge issue. Um, I'm actually chair of the Diabetic Kidney Disease Task Force for the American Society of Nephrology. And um, we also have a major paper coming out from our group called Moving from Evidence to Implementation. It'll be coming out in JSON where we address a number of the barriers. They really occur at all levels from the system to providers to patients. But perhaps the largest barrier is the cost in the United States. In US dollars, the average retail price at the pharmacy for a patient after insurance uh, for an SGLT2 inhibitor or finerenone is $500 to $800 a month. And when you think about the fact that these patients are usually on multiple medicines, it's, you know, that price is just really out of reach for most people. And also if we think about the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which we haven't talked about today, but are also really emerging as very important cardiovascular agents in this population and possibly going to be other class of kidney protective agents should the flow trial deliver, they're even more expensive, 800 to 1200 a month. And then when you talk about combining these therapies on top of everything else they're taking, I mean, it really becomes a privileged few who can afford them in the US. Now I've actually looked at the data from the United Kingdom and other countries in Europe and China, you all pay about 20% of the US price, but that's still a lot of money for many people when you talk about multiple therapies. So you know, I think we need to ground dreams with reality, right? Because we're talking about this pie in the sky world where people could get finerenone and an SGLT2 and a GLP-1 and an ACE and an ARB and expensive insulins. Um, you know, I, I think we need to then, you know, come down to planet Earth and really think about what's possible. In the U.S., the ASN is putting together a policy action plan that's going to be presented at the highest level of our government with regard to health policy. But truly, if we don't affect the cost issue, I don't think we can even get to the other issues at the system provider and patient level. So in the US, I think the biggest issue is cost. Outside the US and, and really everywhere, I think it will be an educational issue, which is one of the reasons you all have done such a marvelous job of hosting webinars and journal clubs, getting the word out to people, giving practical tips like we've heard today about how to implement these therapies. And I think all that should continue. We should be working in parallel. And then the other big deal is the workforce because the number of patients who potentially could receive these therapies is staggering worldwide. There aren't enough nephrologists to do this. Uh, and so we've really talked a lot about multidisciplinary and multi-specialty team care. So really the triangulation of diabetes, cardiology, nephrology, and then um, really working with other allied health professionals, particularly pharmacists to come up with um, basically programs that allow pharmacists to help us co-manage especially complicated medication regimens. Um, so I'll stop there. I know that's a lot, but that's a huge question. No, that, that's great. I think that's a good summary. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, so I've got one question that I hope will be quick to answer and then another one that's a bit more of a, a discussion for the panel. So the one that I hope is a bit quicker to answer is for uh, Prof uh, Professor Agarwal. So the question specifically about the paper, was albuminuria similarly reduced in the Credence trial and the Credence-like Fidelio participants? About 30% in both, yes. Okay, that was nice and straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the next question is from an anonymous attendee, um, and really we've kind of alluded to the fact that the standard of care currently considers um, ACEs and ARBs to be the standard of care in, in people with CKD, and particularly diabetic CKD. Should, should we now be expanding our understanding of and our labelling of what the standard of care should be to encompass um, some of these other drugs? And I'm going to divert it to Paddy, who's been quiet for a little while. Sure. Um, I hope you can still hear me. I had to go off mic. Um, so, so I think actually, and I keep on saying we can learn from cardiology. I think the heart, because there's a lot of parallels with heart failure here. And I think the European Society of Cardiology's uh, recent guidelines for heart failure are interesting because they now have a standard of care as a four drug combination of, I guess, right, <laughs> renal angiotensin sustenance blockade, beta blocker, MRA, and SGLT2, all with grade A, high grade evidence recommendation. And Get them, all, get them all started quickly. I think we in nephrology need to start thinking like that. 
Um, I think the issue which has been highlighted by today's discussion is which is the add-on after the ACE and, uh, ACE and R, ACE and R, because clearly both finerenone and SGLT2 across proteinuric CKD are all now essentially, well, are, you know, stand, should be standard care. And we need to start thinking like that, that it's um, and for diabetic CKD, you could debate this a lot. But um, so I do think standard of care has changed. And I think we need to get our head around that standard of care has changed um, and how to, because I think the, the thing I really worry about with, or not worry about, I would commend what, um, what Cathy said is around the area of you know, therapeutic inertia, getting people onto therapy and who starts it and where, where are they going to the workforce? But bottom line is, yeah, the standard of care has changed and uh, we, we need to move with that. The other thing, I guess, uh, is of course around licensing. You know, I think in Europe, because obviously we are European uh, today, um, Finerenone has, I think, only just received an EMA license or it certainly within the last few weeks. I haven't followed the exact details about the license for Europe, whilst both DAPA for all, you know, all proteinuric CKD and Credence for diabetic CKD, sorry, Credence, uh, canical for for, 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 non uh, for diabetic CKD. So I think there's a licensing issue which kind of makes you follow or where are you going your standard in care? What well, drugs you're allowed to prescribe in your country change things a bit. So... So I think the standard care is going to move fast and we're going to need to stay educated and keep on updating it. It's going to be quite tough, but it's really important to get um, to, to keep working on this. Would anybody else like to comment on that? Sure, I will. And, and to Patty's point, KDGO is coming out with an update this year very soon that will incorporate basically what you heard today. Um, but I think it's going to be an ongoing process because the good news is we have therapies coming forward like we've never seen before in our field. And, you know, the GLP-1 receptor agonists are, are going to be, I be, think, emerging prominently as well. Um, <clears throat> there are some novel agents, uh, particularly anti-inflammatory uh, and antifibrotic agents, endothelin antagonists. These may become more niche therapies, though, for people who continue to progress despite the standard of care. And if, if I caught the question right in the Q&A, I think somebody raised the question of really what should be the first drug. And I'd just like to remind everybody, we do have an established standard of care, but it's really been based on the order in which they received regulatory approval uh, and, and drug development timelines. Whether or not we really know the hierarchy of which drug we should give first, we don't know because we haven't studied them that way. But you know, if you look at the effect sizes, and I really want to congratulate Dr. Agarwal on a very eloquent presentation, um, trying to help us understand uh, the contrasts and similarities between Fidelio and Credence. You know, these agents really have remarkable effect sizes on top of ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And for those of us, I think someone said there, that we're uh, three of us are, are older than, than, than our hosts. But um, you know, if, if we walk back to the, what we saw with the original renal and IDNT studies that established, for example, ARBs for type 2 diabetes with proteinuric CKD, again, with all the caveats that Dr. Agarwal mentioned about comparing trials, but still, by and large, it looks like the effect size was substantially smaller, and that was on no therapy. So when you see the effect sizes we're seeing on top of those, you could reasonably ask the question, whether or not one of those agents should be the first agents. And I'm not saying that they are. The standard of care is what it is. But those are important questions to ask, especially as we get to issues of polypharmacy and cost. If you can give one drug, which one are you going to choose? I think Kathy raises a very important point, you know, and I, I really admire what she has done in terms of uh, talking about costs and access. Um, I was asked to give a lecture to the Indian Society of Nephrology recently. I looked up the costs of these drugs in India. You know, I, I was born in India, I was raised in India. And India is the, really the epicenter for diabetes and the epidemic of uh, diabetic uh, associated diseases. So I asked the question, if I was in India today, what would it cost to treat me? And I looked up the costs of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. Phenernone hadn't even reached there, and the Flozins. I was surprised. Flozins, I can prescribe for less than the cost of an unbranded antihypertensive in India. Apparently, it's off pattern there. 
So I can give for 10 rupees or you know a few cents a day I SGLT2 inhibitor in India. I can tell you hardly anybody is getting that drug or the way they should be, even though they are really inexpensive. GLP-1 RAs, on the other hand, was more like 5,000 rupees for an injection, more like a US price. I'm just saying these were the Google prices I saw. But I said, wow, there's a huge difference in the way you prescribe these medications. But like Kathy said, if these medications sit on our shelves, it's not going, we are only going to be talking about them virtually on these places. They have to go to the patients and the patients need to take it. I have seen so many doctors, you know, I've been prescribing SGLT2 inhibitors pretty much after credence trial. I've seen so many doctors take off the SGLT2 inhibitors permanently after the first genital mycotic infection. I have to actually convince the patient, hey, I can treat you. This is about your heart and your kidneys and less about a tiny infection, I can treat you. No doc, I'm not going on that. I think we have, it's everybody's problem. I think we have to look at it, say, okay, yes, I know that this is a potential adverse effect, but we can surmount that. What if you are in a heart failure or you're on dialysis? That's a big deal. And it's our job to actually explain to the patients the importance of these therapies and how much difference they can make for them. Great, thank you. So I'm going to call this the final question because we're closing, uh, we're getting to the end of our allotted time. Um, so final question that we'll, we'll ask. So um, there's been a comment from Robert Lowatschkik uh, to say that the Credence data set and outcomes have been validated by an independent institution as an academic research uh, organization was involved. And there's a question about, I guess, adjudication of outcomes and validation of the data set for Fidelio DKD. Um, so I wonder uh, if you'd like to comment on that, Professor Agarwal. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, you know, um, and I probably can comment on it because I had participated both in the Credence trial and the, you know, I was actually chair of the adjudication committee of the Credence trial. And I was likewise the chair of the adjudication committee in the Fidelio and Figaro trials. So I'm, I'm not you know, partial to either one of them. I've seen these two amazing drugs being developed. But there's a, a school of thought that uh, thinks that, okay, Credence was done in collaboration with an academic research organization. And therefore those data are more valid because they were analyzed both by the company, but also by an academic research organization. In contrast, Fidelio Figaro was only sponsored by the company. There was no academic research organization. So maybe these data are not as valid. And let me tell you, I completely disagree with that sentiment because the ultimate adjudicator for these outcomes is the FDA and EMEA. They ask for the raw data from all these companies and they analyze these raw data themselves. And only if, they find that there's a substantial uh, efficacy and minimize the safety, you know, they will approve the drug. And both these drugs are approved. I don't think that people should even debate that ARO was involved with one and the, not with the other. So one is more valid than the other. I don't think that's a valid argument. I think we should really thank that there is an FDA and EMEA to look at these data independently. And when they say that this is good, we just have to trust the people who are uh, have no conflict, zero conflicts, and they are looking at these data and your regulators are saying, we find that this is good. I think we just have to believe it. I don't think that ARO, non-ARO is an argument at all. Okay, thank you. And Paddy, it looks like you volunteered to ask, answer a quick question live about aldosterone breakthrough. Was that a, intentional? No, I, I clicked on it out of interest. Um, so, uh, so it's a great question. So, so do, does you know, does uh, does the phenomenon of aldosterone breakthrough, i.e., normal or elevated aldosterone levels in in serum in people who are fully treated with renal angiotensin system blockade, would that suggest that? the deleterious effect of, ald of aldosterone on kidney fibrosis and cardiac fibrosis explain some of the benefits for uh, 
uh, for Fenero. The answer is I, I don't know, but I think it's a pretty good hypothesis. Um, we certainly, so we did a small research project by one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Alison Taylor, did a project looking at aldosterone uh, breakthrough in CKD. It's present if you infuse people with volume uh, with CKD who are well treated, they still have higher aldosterone levels. It doesn't suppress as quickly as, as expected. It's a small paper that we published in Clinical Science. Um, so I, I think it's a, I think it's a good. I mean. I, that was part of the reason we sort of did this kind of work because we knew that there was this class of drug coming through and we were interested in this phenomenon. I don't think it's ever gone away as a topic of interest. I guess going back to, to Rajiv, um, do you, will, you have serum, will you have serum samples to start addressing these sorts of questions to look at the um, aldosterone and its metabolites in people down the line in, in the trial? Great question, uh, Patty. So actually, we wrote a review on this uh, that was published in European Heart Journal. And we talk about it at uh, some length, you know, so there are uh, two uh, cells uh, in the body, cardiomyocytes and podocytes, that don't express the 11 beta HSD2. You know, the 11 beta hydroxysteroid uh, dehydrogenase 2 is the enzyme that neutralizes cortisol to cortisone, which is now cannot bind to the MR. In these two organs, the primary activator of the mineralocorticoid receptor is not aldosterone, but a thousand fold higher cortisol. So when you are having a high cortisol level, you actually can actually abrogate with the MR blockade, not through an aldosynthase in there. The second point is, are these any of any importance? And there's a very nice study done in the lab of Greg Tesh, and that looks at the uh, uh, producing a mutation in the myelocorticoid receptor only in the myeloid cell. So you can knock out the myeloid receptor in the, the mineralocorticoid receptor in the myeloid cell versus the podocyte. And if I'm a nephrologist and you ask me the question, myeloid cell or podocyte, which one do you think will give you more benefit? I said, duh, it'll be a podocyte knockout. And podocyte knockout had no effect at all. But you block the myeloid receptor, um, myeloid cell, MR, with a knockout, you actually have a magical effect on a glomerulonephritis model. And similar effects were seen with a precursor of phenernone. So I think these are complicated questions, but we often forget that the MR is activated both by cortisol and aldosterone, and cortisol is a thousandfold more than aldo. So I don't know, I don't think that we'll analyze, we don't have samples or we'll analyze these samples. But my thing is that hey, it's a lot more complicated, but mechanisms aside, if I find that you can reduce the risk of going in the ho hospital with heart failure by 28%, and you can re reduce the risk of going on dialysis by 20% with phenernone, I said, I don't care how it's working. This is good stuff. Give it to me. Okay, so on, on that note, um, I'll just remind everybody to hang on, please, and complete the survey. It'll just take you a few seconds so we can try and make these sessions as good as possible. Um, so today's session was terrific. Thank you, Raji, particularly for your presentation, and to our esteemed panel, uh, Kathy and Paddy. Um, very kind of you to join us. Um, great discussion. I think it's clear that there's a lot of unanswered questions, and we're all going to sit and wait with bated breath as the SGLT2 MRA story continues to unfold. Um, so on behalf of Jennifer and myself, thank you very much to everybody and uh, have a good day or a good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you.